prince of Egypt dies. Professional frustration caused Michael Carreras to leave in 1961. I went off and did my thing for a couple of years. Made a, I did a musical, which I always wanted to do. I made a western, which things I would never have been able to do at Hammer. Executive chores fell to Tony Hines, who handed the producer's reins to Tony Nelson Keyes and later Aida Young, one of the first female producers in England. I don't think Aida was as dedicated as we were. She, um, rightly so in a way, her, uh, her idea was just to get the film through. It was Tony Hines' unpleasant duty to keep costs down. Jack Asher's painstaking photography took time. Time was money. Other cameramen like Michael Reed and Arthur Grant became regulars. Budgets were stretched to the limit. I said, there's one way you can make them, we can make them back to back. That is to say we do a picture, same car, same sets, and do two pictures. I remember seeing Rasputin, the Mad Monk, and the Reptile, and, and they were all shot in the same sets. Uh, Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and Plague of the Zombies were all shot in the same sets. So it was sort of like watching the same picture twice. Cary Grant suggested he'd like to try a horror picture, so Tony Hines reworked Phantom of the Opera, but Grant dropped out. The role was played by Herbert Long. More than in any other film, Terry Fisher emphasized the romance and sadness in the story. Because the script was written for Cary Grant, the dirty business was left to a homicidal dwarf. The distributor publicized the film widely as a horror story. But as anyone knows who has read the guest on the Rue novel or seen the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, it is a tragic romance. Missing the point, Time magazine called the Phantom about as dangerous as dear old granddad dressed up for Halloween. The distributor blamed the failure on Terence Fisher, who did not direct a hammer for two years. The unused climax of Brides of Dracula was revamped, if you'll pardon the expression, by Tony Hines in Kiss of a Vampire. Director Don Sharp proved as adept at gothic eroticism as Terence Fisher. Even more so than in Dracula, vampirism is linked to sexual appetites. Richard Matheson, author of The Incredible Shrinking Man, adapted his novel I Am Legend, but the script proved too intense for the censors. Hammer sold it to Robert Lippert, who shot it in Italy with Vincent Price as last man on earth. But Matheson also adapted a classic Dennis Wheatley novel, retitled by American distributors. They worried that audiences would assume the devil rides out had to be a cowboy movie. I remember Tony Hines ringing me and saying, Jimmy, you've got to do a very good job on this because I don't think it's working. Anyway, he was quite wrong in his judgment, wasn't he? Lights. Well, what about the light? They seem to be dimmer. Terry Fisher was back as director. And whenever he gave me a close-up, I'd make a point of walking up to him and slipping a fiver into his hand. Crew really believed I'd bribed him for a close-up every time we did it. In 1968, Hammer Films received the Queen's Award for Industry for bringing two and a half million pounds into Britain. The creators of the Avengers brought Hammer a movie idea inspired by a lunchtime joke. Brian Clemens was, was sitting there, and Brian suddenly said, he mixes up the potion, he drinks it, and he turns into a woman. Well, if we all fell about laughing, he said, very funny idea, but he wasn't laughing. He went home and he wrote the script. Ralph Bates played one of the title roles, but the company had some difficulty coming up with Dr. Jekyll's better half. There was some talk about me playing Sister Hyde. Then a very fine actress went on to, to play. 
there was quite a bit of nudity and I wasn't uh, that keen on that. Well, David Booth, I think, was the name of the agent, said, Oh, Martine, it's perfect. You've come at the absolute perfect time. And they said, they've got the guy and they're really, and it's Hammer. And I said, Michael Carreras? He said, yes. And I read the script and I realized that they had some nudity and I said, okay, fine, top but not full nudity. Well, I agreed to do that because I thought it was an important change. And in fact, I still think it's probably one of the best scenes in the film. But of course, once you saw the two of them together, it was a, a brilliant piece of casting. And she did it very well, too. Um, but unfortunately, he was pressured. I think everybody was pressured, including Hammer, was being pressured into going into more nudity and more nudity, you know, to compete with what was going on. And um, they decided to go even further to full frontal nudity when I got on the set. And I said, I did not agree to that, you know. So we had a bit of a contretemps. However, I used all of that sort of nervousness and that sort of rage and anger and stuff to birth myself, really. I mean, when I am there, I don't know anything about my anatomy. It is I who exist, Dr. Jekyll, not you. It is I who will be rid of you. Rid of you! God, isn't that an interesting idea, the male to the female? And, oh, this could be so great. They could have taken it so much further. It's a hide, isn't it? Uh, how is your brother? He hasn't been himself of late. Years later, when I saw Roy Ward Baker, he said to me, Martine, I wish we had really gone into the male-female. And that they did. As the 1970s progressed, the new formula became a little more blood and a lot more flesh. Victorian costumes lent themselves to fascinating visuals. And as early as 1959, Hammer added nudity, the man who could cheat death. Which is a remake of The Man in Half Moon Street, with Niels Astor. And it could cheat death. Anton Diffring was one of the uh, premier actors of the Berlin Theatre. I've been taking this fluid every six hours now. It's madness. It is what keeps me alive. It was very necessary. It was in very good taste. But England at that time would have no nudity. So there was a version which they paid me extra for, for Europe. And it was very beautifully done. It was beautifully done. Exploitation. I think, I think Hammer films were exploitation films. I mean, exploitation films basically are, are films that are designed to exploit via advertising a particular sensational aspect and, and the, if you ever look at the British ads for Hammer films they are incredibly tasteless. I mean they really make the pictures look like AIP pictures from the 50s whereas the American ads tend to be models of restraint actually in comparison. Unlike actors, actresses were often used as window dressing, rarely appearing in more than two or three films for the company. I'd been doing a, a poster for an English campaign called Lamb's Navy Rum. And apparently he used to see this big hoarding or this big poster every day. Supposedly, he said, find that girl and, and bring her in. I, I was put under contract for a year, which is wonderful. But no, 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 no duties, no official duty. I had a photograph on the front page of one of the tabloid papers in England one Sunday, and Jimmy Career saw it and said, I'd like that girl from my next Hammer film. He would take care of you. He was a fatherly type figure, and uh, he had everyone's respect. Outside producers approached Hammer with the Victorian ghost story by Sheridan Lefferty. The producers of it, Harry Fine and Michael Stile, came to me and asked me to do it. But they were reading into it a great deal of lesbianism, which I don't think Sheridan Lefferty would ever sort of dreamed of, and, and neither did I, incidentally. It was the old story that a uh, hundred vampire pictures have been made. What on earth can we do next with vampires? I know. We'll make them lesbians. Yeah, brilliant. It's very funny, actually, because I walked onto the set the first day of my shooting. The fangs kept falling out. <laughs> and they kept falling into Kate O'Mara's cleavage. And the crew wanted to... Uh, help retrieve them. And it's very easy 
uh, to make lunatics or vicars or, or indeed lesbians or homosexuals of, of, of various kinds, to make them figures of fun. To me, that is fatal. I, I think that's, uh, well, it's, it's downright rude and vulgar, apart from anything else. Co-production funds came from Hammer's opposite number in Hollywood, American International Pictures. I had a certain amount of criticism while I was making it, that it wasn't going to be juicy enough, you know, and all that. Ingrid Pitt proved as enticing to co-star Ferdy Main as to the camera. Knew each other, we'd met in Salzburg and worked there together. I thought, well, I won't forget that one. I mean, she used rather provocative language um, in between takes, and, and it was rather delicious to be bitten by her. straight through her and she just disappears. It's, it's a romantic view, an essential element in horror pictures which has been almost, well now, totally lost. Even before the film was finished, an ill-fated sequel began on the same set. Jutta Stainsgård replaced Ingrid Pitt as Carmilla. Peter Cushing dropped out because of the illness of his wife. He was replaced by Ralph Bates. Terry Fisher was scheduled to direct and Terry got sick, and that was about within two or three weeks of starting shooting, and they asked me would I like to do it, and I said yes. I was engaged as a director without much muscle. Hated the movie, hated it. But I was a peasant charging on Dracula's castle with thousands of other people, you know, and I, I was a sort of featured peasant. Evidence? Of what? That you are a vampire. With you to Stensgard. <laughs> I don't mean to demean her talent in any way. I think she's very talented and did a lovely job. Her claim to fame was a, a toothpaste commercial and, um, and uh, very, very well endowed and also which helped, uh, I'm sure. Doubly endowed were Mary and Madeline Collinson, Playboy's first twin centerfolds, stars of the third spin-off. Devil has sent me twins of evil. The Camilla character was reduced to a bit part. It kept doing the same things to death. I mean, it was like a big thrill to have a lesbian vampire movie, which is, uh, it turned out to not be something that people particularly wanted to see anyway. Sometimes the sex was worse than arbitrary. A rape scene in Frankenstein must be destroyed. Ironically, it's later cut as unnecessary. That was a big disappointment to me, and it was to Peter as well. We, we talked about that a lot. We were not very comfortable about it because we'd almost completed the whole film. There was no reason. I had no reaction to uh, Frankenstein as if he'd raped me, e even though the scene was put in the film much earlier. That was a very difficult thing for me to do. And it was difficult for Terry, too. He was, he was very sensitive about it. And in the end, he just said, enough is enough. He, and he cut the cameras. He just didn't want to continue them. Female fiends never found the audience of the male monsters. Actresses fared better with the non-fantasy thrillers. Susan Strasberg in Taste of Fear, Bette Davis in The Nanny, Tallulah Bankhead in Fanatic.